Right. Edinburgh history. 8500 BC. 8500 BC. 8500 BC. There's evidence of habitation right here at Castle Rock. And that hill way down there, Arthur's Rock, by ancient Britain peoples. The people that lived around here, were, from archaeological evidence, were influenced by Celtic tribes. Different legends have this, not this current castle, but there was a castle on the spot of some sort, being on the rock. This could be the longest continuously inhabited place in Scotland. A king of the Britons, this is part legend, but there might be some truth to it, is thought to establish York Castle, Dumbarton Castle, and Edinburgh Castle around 989 BC. But not a lot is known about that time. Uh, the Maiden's Castle, it was known. And archaeological evidence does indicate that there's been some sort of castle from late 1000 to 500 BC on this spot around that time. So. Maybe the legends are true. But we're talking prehistory here. No one wrote about it. By the time the Romans got here, though, in 82 AD, they got here, the Romans pushing up north in Britannia, 82 AD. They recorded a Celtic people here that lived here called the Botandi. 140 to 170 AD, the Romans pushed their way north up here, just north of the Antonine Wall. Really, they wanted access to this coast out here. There's the force that connects to the North Sea. They actually passed by this rock and uh, built a fort on the coast there, right in that direction. An old Roman fort around 150 AD, 140 to 170 which was slightly north of the Antonine Wall to give access to the coast. So ships could sail in from far away as the, you know, who knows, Italy, Turkey, Egypt, the Roman Empire needed to be connected, man. Likely a place where ships could dock, it was likely a place where ships could dock and supply troops and goods to the fort on the wall, which was right down there, Antonine's Wall. <laughs> The fort was abandoned but briefly reoccupied 208 to 214 AD. A road was been built connecting that fort all the way down to Eborcombe, York, England. An old road that parts of it still exist and it's kind of used though. Eborcombe, modern day York, was the largest northern Roman settlement. The fort later grew to become Eden. All right, so after the Roman retreat, people started moving back in, local tribes. Romans weren't here for too long, though. But uh, let's fast forward. Not a lot is known until about 600 AD. A Welsh traveler came all the way up here with some soldiers and built a fortress on Castle Rock here, Edinburgh Castle. There's the rock. Obviously, it's not easy to attack from that end. <laughs> a good place to build a fortress. Um, to oppose Germanic settlers, the Angles, which the word England comes from, and Anglo-Saxon. Angles came from, not Germany, but that region. They came and attacked all of Britain, starting around that time. But the Welsh that were defending this area were massacred and the Angle Kingdom of Bernicia grew in the area. I think down that way a little bit. So they started controlling this region. And then in 638, the Angle Northumbria, Northumbria Kingdom defeated the local tribes around here, around the present day city. And this was the first time the city was passed from Brythonic Celts to Northumbrian control. The northernmost boundary of the Northumbria kingdom was right here. The coast there. Force connects to the North Sea. 
The Angles of Northumbria fought the vicious Picts around here in 1710 using the castle probably as a fortress, Castle Rock. Again, not a lot is known about this time, but the city picked up an old English suffix. I'm an English teacher, a suffix of bur, bur, which is where the word Edinburgh originated, which involved, that involved into Edinburgh. A church was mentioned in 844 in the area around Castle Rock, but it no longer exists. It might be the area where the St. Giles Cathedral is down there a little ways. No one's known, but it was recorded, 854 AD. So still, this was a frontier town and very small. None of this existed yet. It's mostly hills and probably small fishing villages on the water over there. Around 875 to 895, though, Vikings from Norway and Denmark raided and took over this area slowly. But first, they took over York, way to the south in England, and established the kingdom of Denelaw. So this northern part of Northumbria got cut off, cut off from the rest. The Scott locals moved in around here and renamed the area its Brythonic name Lothian, which is still the county to the south's name today. After the Vikings came in and disrupted the Angle Northumbrians. Around 900 AD, the area came under the influence of the first kingdom of Scotland which was established in 843. English King Althastan, I love this guy's name, it has a weird A and E, old English spelling. He beat back the Vikings near York and battled his way all the way up here to 934, but he did not achieve victory against the first Scottish kingdom. And retreated. Anyway, the area would remain under Scots control and the Scot name Eden was first recorded as a city name in the annals of Kingdom of Alba. 90, 973 AD, Royal Council of Chester, England granted Lothian to the Scots without any further intervention for now. <laughs> you did it, bro. <laughs> All right, so here we are on the Royal Mile. The Northumbrians let the Scots have their area up here. Uh, 1018, though, they broke their promise and tried to push north again, but were defeated by the Scots in the Battle of Carham. The Normans, who took over the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of England, uh, invasion of 1066 didn't really affect Scotland initially. The King of Scotland, named Malcolm Canmore, who reigned from 1058 to 1093, had his royal court in a town slightly north, north. But he began spending a lot more time in Edinburgh, where he built a chapel. For his wife, who became St. Margaret, inside the walls of the uh, castle there. Still stands to this day, one of the oldest buildings in the city. The castle was fortified up around it later on. <coughs> but, uh, so it was an important city for the king. He liked hanging out here. The bagpipes were going. They'll, they'll come back. <laughs> the late 1000s AD is when the current castle was first recorded. All right, so 1130 AD, Edinburgh was officially established as a merchant town and royal burg. As and the fortress was built in settlements along the slopes of the Castle Rock, which is right here. The oldest parts of the modern city. Now called the Royal Mile. And once again, England started messing with the area. Not for the last time either. <laughs> or the first time. They meddled in the region and took it over two times. From 1291 to 1314 and again 1333 to 1341 during the Scottish Wars of Independence. You know, William Wallace, Robert the Bruce, all that stuff. It's a little confusing on who was ruling what, and different people were occupying the castle, Scots, English, Earls, 
do all kinds of things. I won't get into the details, but I'll just say though, during this time, even when the English were ruling the city, it became a very profitable port and grew as a port town during this time. Trey, uh, the older port town was disturbed by the wars that existed before this. So the population began to grow steadily through the rest of the 1300s and 1400s. It dealt with some bouts of the plague. Kind of rough to think about in this time, but still it was a big, became becoming a big city. Slowly over time. 1438 was a ground, groundbreaking moment. The Scottish Parliament began meeting in Edinburgh, moving from Scone for the first time. Oh, Scottish pride. And yes, they got the city back. Scots, 1341 from the English. Bagpiper is on site. Royal Mile. All this part of the mile. Alright, here at uh, 1124 AD. St. Giles Church. It was originally Catholic. But in the 1500s, the city of Edinburgh played a big role in the Protestant Reformation, which was happening all over Europe and different areas and Scotland. Mary, Queen of Scots in 1561, who returned from exile in France, was greeted in the town peacefully, but the new Protestant leadership was weary of her because she was Catholic and she was also planning to take the English crown and make it Catholic again. All this royal drama, lots of crazy stuff. She was preached against Mary, Queen of Scots, right here, St. Giles Cathedral. So this cathedral is the birthplace of Presbyterianism, which is the state church of Scotland. And it was around that time when uh, that was happening she actually, the Mary, the Queen of Scots, was holed up in a palace because of these Protestant leadership. Uh, you know, that were against her, and she was forced to abdic abdicate the throne in 1567. She was in prison somewhere close here to Edinburgh, and uh, she escaped, which resulted in a civil war between loyalists to her and the new Protestant Presbyterian. And there's banging on my video, that's all right. <laughs> 1573 saw the siege of Eden Edinburgh Castle, capture, capturing of her main supporters, Edinburgh Castle, right down that way a little bit. Uh, so yeah, after this point, led by this church here, all of Scotland started becoming Protestant, Presbyterian, but there was a rift. There was also another sect of people, the Episcopalians, who had slight differences, exactly what. I'm not sure. <laughs> then there was Catholics, and then in England you had the Anglicans, and all kinds of weird stuff. So, in 1603, kind of bringing everything together, King James the Sixth inherited the English and Scottish throne at the same time because of some family tree craziness with the Tudors and all these other people. He was the king of Scotland and England all at once. So he moved his royal court down to London. Uh, but they essentially functioned as two separate kingdoms. Really it was the merchants who had access to the sea all around here. Below these hills, you can't see it from here, that ran Edinburgh when the king took off to London. Although it remained home to the Scottish Parliament, which is right here too. 1600s though. Here we are at the church, saw many more religious strifes between Presbyterians and Episcopalians, Protestants. More many Scottish were either on one side or the other, uh, resulting in many deaths and executions and all kinds of crazy people getting burned at the stake. Presbyterianism ended up winning out in all this craziness. St. Giles Church, the leader of that. And it just has me thinking, man, you know, Jesus Christ, Galilee. If he ever could envision such murder and massacre in his name, especially in all that I learned about in Europe, especially around 15, 1600s, it's 
It's just lunacy, man. It's crazy. It's really crazy. But once again, all these things happen. And it even happened here. Would Jesus want that? I don't think so. But, you know, it's history. So the English uh, and the Scottish king, I guess, King Charles I tried to implement Anglicanism, the Church of England in Scotland, which led to even more backlash, more war, because of those slight differences. And, you know, there's always animosity between English and Scotland to this day. <laughs> but, uh... In 1650, this led up to Scotland being involved in the English Civil War. Scotland supported a reinstatement of a Scottish king. And, uh, that was an interesting person, punk rock, punk rock. A royalist army attempted to go on the offensive in England to, be, to, fe to defeat their forces from Scotland, but lost in a battle in Worcester, far south from here. A puppet commander that was loyal to England was put in place to run Scotland by Cromwell here in Edinburgh. But, so the parliamentary forces won. The monarchy was abolished just for a few times. Just a short amount of time. Because at Cromwell's death, the commander here in Edinburgh, the puppet, decided to rally his troops and headed south to London to re-establish the English monarchy. All that <laughs> craziness. Ah, interesting. Okay, think out the people. Ancient. All right, so this quick interjection here. This is Old Town. You can see the cramped conditions, how everyone was living in here. After the 1600s, this place was built like this to keep the English out and then 1700s, 18, Old Town began to be kind of a slum. Had all kinds of people milling around, unsanitary conditions. And the reason why a new town out there was built. And now it's, you know, tourist nice area, but back in those days it probably would have been pretty rough in this tunnel down here. The 1800s. So late 1700s. All right, let's go to Newtown. What better place to do wrap up and get into the modern times of Edinburgh than right here? Where in view here, you can see two of Edinburgh's favorite Christianity sects: Episcopal in the Church of Scotland, Presbyterian, and Edinburgh Castle in the background there. Hey. Scottish flag. Okay. So, the city was fortified down here, the new, new, new town. We'll get into that in a second. The main part of the city, though, was up there by that hill. It was fortified to repel any further English re rebellion coming up here. So, uh, but Scotland was struggling financially. But, uh, the city began to work with England. In 1707, the parliaments of England and Scotland signed the Acts of Union, establishing the United Kingdom, which exists to this day. And Scotland's access to the growing British Empire sparked growth in the economy of the country and the city. The city, though, because of its walled-off nature, 1600 plans up there became suffered from overcrowding and visitors were astonished at the conditions of people from all walks of life having to be together, lots of illnesses, squalor conditions, slums back in that area. The many social classes and unsanitary places, cramped conditions and narrow alleys. So the 1700s is when Edinburgh became the bustling city saw the start of the Scottish Enlightenment and expansion. The city began to be planned a little bit different than its tight quarters area of Old Town down this way, and this is now Edinburgh New Town was built. Uh, some notable events, 1745, a Highland clan uprising, not happy with the United Kingdom Union, briefly took over the city, but then lost it. Uh, and after that, around 1750s, when city planners really wanted to focus on emulating London. 
I can see it. Hey, there's our guys, <laughs> William Wallace. Oh, that's another story. <laughs> but anyways, the city planners, especially in this area, Newtown, wanted to emulate the structure of London. Very successful, esteemed world city at the time, in the late 1700s. And uh, the Scottish Enlightenment and focus on education in the city was thought of the, one of the leading towns of thinkers in Europe. Especially after the Scottish Parliament was dissolved and the Parliament went to Winchester, London only. Uh, the leading men now had more times on their time on their hands, new wealth, and focus on education, science, and the arts of Scotland. And a lot of scientific discoveries and different things happened in Edinburgh. Benjamin Franklin even visited twice in 1759 and 1771 to meet with leading scientists and thinkers. 1800s saw the new ne the neoclassical architecture began to be built that we most of what we see today. It was known as the Athens of the North. All this architecture here. This street over here. Came Newtown, probably the main boulevard, the busy modern city. So let's get into the 1800s here. The city's biggest two industries, two of the biggest, were brewing beer and distilling whiskey. Nice. Cheers. <laughs> I like that. Uh, the new shopping thoroughfares, like this, to be opened up and became real popular. Uh, it left actually the old town into a pretty bad slump up that way, which it obviously isn't now, but uh, mid, mid to late 1800s was pretty crazy. But industry and industrial revolution shifted more industry towards Glasgow and it took Edinburgh as the most uh, populous city of Scotland, even though this is the capital of Scotland. But overall it was doing okay. World War I saw some German Zeppelins bomb the city, balloons, which is crazy. And World War II saw a few bombings of the dockyards, 1940 and 1942. But uh, 1940s and 50s, over here a little bit. Hey, there's a perfect scheme for this. The 1940s and 50s saw a lot of Irish immigrants coming to the this Irish flag here. Uh, a lot of them came to work on the dockyards and the different industries in the city. 1980s saw the slow of the industry, especially, sadly, the brewing industry. Oh, man, I would have loved to visit those old breweries. That's cool. That would have been cool. Uh, though, in 1998, the Scottish Parliament was re-established in the city to look after Scottish governance, even though it is still under Westminster of London. But now it's one of the most visited cities in the UK. Huge tourist hub, beautiful architecture, modern bustling city. And now I'm here, history of Edinburgh. All right, let's drink some whiskey. <laughs> 